Hi, this is the AI Storyteller. I'm Mark. The book I'm interpreting for you in this issue is The Name of the Rose. Since its publication, this novel has achieved both critical acclaim and popularity. It has become a focus of scholarly research and has sold 50 million copies worldwide, adapted into films twice. It cleverly combines a popular detective story with obscure philosophical speculations, widely recognized as the progenitor of knowledge-based detective novels. If you find this statement unfamiliar, think of Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code. The difference lies in the fact that even if you know the solution, the name of the rose is still worth rereading. The name of the rose has a peculiar title, and many people were initially enticed to buy the book because of it. Yet, even after reading the entire book, some still struggle to articulate the meaning of the title. You might wonder, isn't the name of the rose just a rose? That would be too simplistic. We should note that the author of this book, Umberto Eco, is Europe's most famous semiotician, historian, philosopher, public intellectual, and novelist. These titles are not randomly assigned. Eco had already gained fame as a semiotician in Europe before publishing his first novel at the age of 48, which happens to be the name of the rose. What playful twist could a semiotician bring, and what does the name of the rose really mean? I'll keep you in suspense and provide the answer later. Let's not discuss the rose for now. Let's talk about the book. The Name of the Rose is a book about books, academically referred to as postmodern metafiction. In simpler terms, it's a story about books written by a book lover. Eco might be the ultimate book enthusiast, as every time topics like what's the use of reading? Or will paper books disappear from history? Come up, Eco's name is almost always mentioned. Eco owned over 50,000 books in his private collection, many of which were extremely rare editions. Here's a little anecdote. A guest once saw Eco's house filled with books and asked him, Have you read all these books? Eco replied, Of course not. The books I've read are in another place. The ones here are the ones I plan to finish by the end of the month. Although this might be a joke, after hearing my interpretation, you might perceive a different meaning. Well, let's get to the point. Since the name of the rose is a knowledge-based detective novel, the interpretation will be divided into two parts. The first part discusses the detective story, explaining why the clever detective ultimately loses. The second part delves into knowledge, exploring the success and failure of intellectuals. Finally, we'll add a third part to discuss the meaning behind this peculiar title. Let's start with the detective story. The case takes place in the distant year of 1327. The Renaissance is on the horizon, but not yet arrived, and religion still dominates people's lives and thoughts. The church is divided into factions, with the Benedictines and the Franciscans being the two most important. The Benedictine monks reside in various monasteries, holding considerable wealth. The Franciscan monks, on the other hand, roam around, advocating for poverty. The two factions are set to engage in a theological debate, and the venue is a monastery in the northern mountains of Italy, home to the richest library in the Christian world. Our protagonist, William of Baskerville, accompanied by his young student Adso of Melk, comes to the monastery to represent the Franciscans in the debate. In those times, people were referred to by their names without mentioning their surnames, only adding the location. The name Baskerville is fictional, borrowed from The Hound of the Baskervilles, a famous Sherlock Holmes story. This name serves to inform the readers that William is a detective akin to Holmes. Adso of Melk, on the other hand, plays the role of Watson, not only acting as a foil for a regular person but also serving as the narrator of the story. William's detective qualities are showcased even before entering the monastery gates. The abbot, accompanied by others, is searching for a lost horse when they encounter William. Surprisingly, William describes the physical features of the horse in detail, including its name, and directs everyone where to find it. Indeed, they find the horse exactly as William predicted. Although William had not seen the horse before, he deduced its quality by the fact that the abbot personally came to search for it. The monks had a set of specific standards for assessing a good horse, including its name. By analyzing the horse's hoof prints in the snow, broken branches, and the road conditions, William could deduce the horse's whereabouts. Once inside the monastery, 
William is tasked by the abbot to investigate a suspicious suicide. The victim is a young monk known for his humorous illustrations, and he seemingly fell from the third floor at night. Suicide is strictly forbidden in Christianity, and access to the library, which contains numerous forbidden books, is not granted lightly. This case is indeed puzzling. William is the embodiment of reason and knowledge, and he admires the legendary library for a long time. However, the librarian refuses to let him in. William argues that without seeing the crime scene, how can he solve the case? The abbot responds, you didn't see the horse, but you still managed to find it. The story unfolds over seven days, primarily following four plot lines. The first involves William chatting with various monks, discussing not only the case but also God and various religious philosophies, some serious contemplation and some playful banter, challenging readers' discernment. This is one of the reasons why this book is worth rereading. The second plotline revolves around a series of continuous murders. The third plotline reveals scandals uncovered during the investigation. The fourth plotline focuses on William's efforts to enter the library. Early the next morning, a second body appeared in the monastery. A monk was found headfirst in a barrel of pig's blood. The deceased was a scholar and translator proficient in Greek, having recently discussed Aristotle with William during the day. It's important to note that Aristotle belongs to Greek philosophy, and many of his works were banned and lost during the Middle Ages. They needed to be translated back into Latin from the earlier Arabic translations. William deduced from the lack of swelling on the face that the person had died before being placed in the blood barrel. A monk skilled in herbs alerted William to the blackened tongue and fingers, indicating symptoms of poisoning. An elderly monk, somewhat eccentric, informed William that these serial killings align with the descriptions in the Book of Revelation. In the Book of Revelation, it is foretold that when the apocalypse comes, seven angels will consecutively sound seven trumpets. The first trumpet brings hail and blood. The second turns a third of the sea into blood. The third causes a burning star to fall into rivers. The fourth darkens one-third of the sun, moon, and stars. The fifth releases locusts with scorpion tails from the underworld. The sixth unleashes four fallen angels riding horses to bring death to the world. After the seventh trumpet, a great red dragon representing Satan, with the code 666, emerges, initiating the final battle between good and evil. On that day, William investigates and uncovers the first scandal of the monastery. The current librarian and his assistant are engaged in an immoral relationship and the assistant has seduced the illustrator, the young monk who jumped off the building. This links both murders to the library. That night, William and Adso sneak into the labyrinthine library for the first time, discovering someone secretly reading. As the person hears them, he slips away with the book through a secret passage, leaving behind a Greek note. William reads the note using glasses but hears a disturbance nearby, chasing after the person but failing to catch them. Upon returning to the table, the glasses are gone. On the third day, the library assistant goes missing, and a blood-stained white cloth is found in his room. That night, William and Adso sneak into the library again, using the Greek note to find a hidden door to a secret room but fail to decipher the password. After coming out, Adso and William separate. Passing by the kitchen, Adso is seduced by a beautiful peasant girl, breaking his vow of celibacy. This reveals another scandal in the monastery. The head chef uses food to lure impoverished peasant girls into prostitution. Meanwhile, William learns from the hunchback kitchen assistant that the first two victims had a secret meeting late at night. After reuniting, Adso confesses to William, who, based on the content of the third trumpet in Revelation, predicts that the missing library assistant may have died in the bathroom, which turns out to be true. The body also has blackened fingers and tongue. William's lost glasses are found by the bathtub, but the stolen book from the night before is missing. On the fourth day, William's debate opponent and representatives from the religious tribunal finally arrive. You may have forgotten that William came here initially for a debate. We can view the religious inquisitor as the second detective or even the second murderer. He extracts a well-known scandal, arresting the peasant girl, the head chef, and the hunchbacked kitchen assistant, forcing confessions. It's a brutal public trial. 
The hunchbacked assistant can barely speak, but under torture, he implicates the head chef. To avoid torture, the head chef willingly takes responsibility for all the murders. The peasant girl is sentenced to be burned as a witch. Adso wants to save her, but William coldly stops him. On the fifth day, the debate finally begins, with the topic being whether Jesus was poor. The monks tirelessly argue whether Jesus' clothes count as possessions, and if the money bag and depictions of Jesus is a real thing. William eloquently argues that Jesus was indeed poor. However, the essence of the debate is not whether Jesus was truly poor but whether the church can be wealthy. William can only win the appearance. After the debate, the religious inquisitor leaves with the wrongfully accused, but a fourth body still appears. The victim is the herbalist monk, found dead in his own laboratory, his head smashed by an armillary sphere, the hit part precisely matching one-third of the sun, moon, and stars, in accordance with the fourth trumpet. William discovers that the deceased wore gloves, suggesting the poison was applied to the stolen book. On the sixth day, the librarian is found dying in the corridor, uttering the phrase the venom of a thousand scorpions before passing away, fitting the description of locusts with scorpion tails from the fifth trumpet. The librarian's poisoning indicates that he too had read the stolen book, revealing that the librarian might be the murderer of the herbalist. However, the book is not with the librarian, indicating that someone else knows the secret. According to the monastery's rules, the only person who can know the secret is the former librarian, hidden in the secret room within the library. At this point, all the clues converge, with only the final step of opening the door to the secret room remaining. William and Adso, based on the content of the sixth trumpet describing a knight, wait in ambush at the stable. Adso, still fixated on the peasant girl, imitates a sentence spoken by the hunchbacked kitchen assistant who was arrested with the girl. This inadvertently inspires William to decipher the code for the secret room. It turns out to be a Latin phrase, literally meaning one of four and seven. The hunchbacked assistant's grammatically incorrect way of speaking makes William realize that the code refers not to the numeral four but to the Latin word four, with its first and seventh letters. Entering the secret room in the library, they find an elderly blind monk who has been waiting. As a reward for William, the monk presents the mysterious forbidden book, which turns out to be the lost second volume of Aristotle's poetics, focusing on comedy. The first volume, which discusses tragedy, is extant. Faced with this blind man, William suddenly understands that there was no murderer strictly following the book of Revelation. Everything was just a series of coincidences. The sequence of events unfolds as follows. The library assistant uses the poetics to entice the illustrator, skilled in drawing comedic illustrations, into a physical relationship. The illustrator, feeling ashamed, jumps off the building but before dying, gives the code to the Greek scholar who enters the secret room. The scholar steals the book, feels unwell after reading it, and seeking help in the kitchen dies there. To avoid implication, the assistant disguises the death by placing the body in the pig's blood barrel simulating a drowning. The assistant also wipes his hands with a cloth, explaining the blood-stained fabric found in his room the next day. Curious about the book, the assistant is discovered by William and Adso that night. Although he escapes from the secret room, he feels unwell due to poisoning. Wishing to relax with a bath, he unexpectedly dies in the bathtub. The herbalist, familiar with the poison, seizes the opportunity to take the book from the assistant's quarters only to be killed by the astrolabe wielded by the current librarian. The librarian witnessed the act and impulsively grabbed the book, which caused the deaths. The current librarian is manipulated by the former librarian into committing the murders. The former librarian warns him about the poisonous nature of the book, but he can't resist the temptation to read it and ends up dying from the poison. Thus, the so-called Revelation-style serial murders are just the result of a group of clumsy book thieves stumbling into each other. William asked the former librarian why he wanted to ban comedy. The former librarian replies that laughter can undermine all serious matters, and once people laugh, they no longer need God. Knowing he can't poison William, the former librarian grabs the book and, while running away, tears it apart and eats it. Finally, using an oil lamp, he sets the remnants of the book ablaze. In doing so, 
He not only destroys the book but also the entire library and the monastery filled with knowledge, scandals, and history. The ultimate destruction predicted by the seventh trumpet of Revelation is thus confirmed. William experiences a significant defeat, feeling disheartened. He hands his glasses to Adso, and they part ways. Why is it said that William suffered a major defeat? Because although he solved the murders, it was based on the wrong premise. Behind his seemingly flawless reasoning, reality is just a tangle of coincidences. He finally realizes that the world lacks both order and meaning, implying that God does not exist. For a monk, what greater failure is there than this? This brings us to the second part. Let's discuss the success and failure of intellectuals. In most Western languages, truth and reality are often expressed by the same word, with the main distinction being whether the initial letter is capitalized. Furthermore, a capitalized truth often equates to God. Hence, we can say that detectives pursuing the truth, intellectuals pursuing reality, and monks seeking God share significant common ground. You might be wondering, didn't the novel, through William of Baskerville, demonstrate that reason and faith cannot coexist, and that monks cannot coexist in a world without God? That's correct, but what I'm about to discuss is not William. It's precisely his adversary, the blind old librarian. I intentionally didn't mention his name earlier because it's quite famous. In the novel, his name is Jorge of Burgos. Isn't that a reference to Jorge Luis Borges? Eco mentioned that when conceptualizing the novel, he didn't intentionally include Borges or designate him as the culprit. However, he needed a blind person guarding the library, and a blind person plus a library equals Borges. But in my view, it's more accurate to say that when Eco decided to write about a library, Borges had to be in it. When Eco created a detective monk like William, he inevitably encounters Borges, even though the latter doesn't necessarily appear as an antagonist. Because ultimately, Borges is the ultimate eco-style intellectual. Of course, saying this might reverse the hierarchy. In fact, just as Dan Brown diluted Eco's ideas with a more popular story, Eco, through a more accessible narrative, retells Borges' ultimate ideals and nightmares of intellectuals. To grasp the essence of the name of the rose, we must look back at two short stories by Borges. The first short story is titled The Library of Babel. In a sense, the name of the rose is like a monastery built outside the infinite library of Babel. According to the setting, the library of Babel has no exterior. It is infinitely tall and infinitely long. The first sentence of this short story is, The universe, which others call the library, is composed of an indefinite and perhaps infinite number of hexagonal galleries. Bibliophiles might be familiar with Borges' famous quote, I have always imagined that paradise will be a kind of library. Similarly, William imparts to Adso, the world, the earth, the heavens, all that we see, is like a book. Yet, as we read further into this short story, we discover that this infinitely vast library of Babel, rather than a paradise, is more akin to a prison. Though it lacks iron bars, you can never find your way out. In the boundless sea of books, distinguishing between right and wrong, truth and falsehood becomes impossible. The knowledge you acquire from one book may be contradicted by the next, and there will always be another book. Thus, the life of an intellectual is somewhat like the fairy tale of a bear trying to shell corn, the first dilemma of intellectuals. Life is too short, and knowledge is too vast. In reality, Eco himself ultimately fell into this dilemma. It is said that he employed numerous university students to help him read books, excerpting profound sentences and posting them on the wall. However, these profound sentences are evidently endless, and no matter how many students he hired, they could never finish copying them all. At the end of the name of the rose, Eco orchestrates a massive fire to burn down the monastery's library, signifying a sense of finality. However, one cannot burn down the library of Babel because, as mentioned at the beginning, it is the universe itself. The second short story we should revisit is titled Death and the Compass, condensing the themes of the name of the rose into twelve pages. This short story is also a detective tale. Murders occur in the north, east, and west of the city, each crime scene bearing a message. The first letter of the name has been pronounced, the second letter of the name has been pronounced, 
and the last letter of the name has been pronounced. The detective believes this is an obscure religious murder, speculating that, as God's name has four letters, there must be a fourth case, and following the symmetry principle, it will undoubtedly happen in the South. Armed with a compass, the detective walks into the traps set by the criminals. The criminals reveal to the detective that the first murder was a pure accident. A drunken robber entered the wrong room and accidentally killed a Jewish theologian. Before dying, the theologian happened to write the first sentence of his thesis. The first letter of the name has been pronounced. Reading the detective's self-satisfied interview in the newspaper, the criminals knew he would disregard common sense and insist on taking the case in a mystical direction, so they decided to kill two more people, leading the detective into a dead end. Like William, this detective unilaterally imposes meaning but fails to realize that this meaning only exists on the symbolic level. This represents the second dilemma of intellectuals, detachment from reality or, in other words, powerlessness in the face of reality. The name of the rose elaborates on this with a longer narrative and more examples. For instance, although William came to debate, his well-reasoned arguments have no impact on the actual religious disputes. Faced with a religious trial, he lacks the courage to break the silence, only watching as innocent people are sentenced to death by Bernie. Furthermore, his deductions fail to prevent any crimes. Instead, they contribute to the ultimate destruction of the library and the monastery. This tragedy is all too common in reality. For example, someone blindly adhering to a particular investment theory might end up bankrupt, or blindly following a health theory might cost them their life. So, how do we overcome these two dilemmas? Clearly, we should not adopt the mindset of the blind former librarian in the novel, who, believing that humans can never achieve omniscience and omnipotence, decides to give up exploring knowledge and making value judgments, choosing to live in ignorance, fear, and fatalism. Instead, when seeking knowledge, we need to maintain enough humility. We shouldn't delude ourselves into thinking that we can grasp all the knowledge in the world, nor should we force the world to operate according to our limited understanding just because we've acquired some knowledge. In fact, William had no need to lose faith in God. God simply did not follow the path of his reasoning. William clearly didn't understand modern economics. According to Adam Smith's theory, the invisible hand is not some external force but rather the result of everyone in the market playing their own interests. The ultimate destruction of the monastery might be the punishment brought about by this invisible hand. William also didn't grasp postmodern literary theory. When numerous absurd coincidences don't necessarily indicate a chaotic and absurd world but could be the deliberate arrangement of a more advanced author for the sake of parody. Lastly, let's return to our author Eco. Eco is a semiotician, yet throughout the name of the rose, he writes about the misinterpretation of symbols by humans. However, the allure of symbols lies precisely in the various interpretations they can generate. In annotations to the name of the rose, Eco writes, the poetic effect is the ability of a text to produce various interpretations. Eco directly incorporates the most poetic enigma into the title. The word rose rarely appears in the book, with one occurrence near the end. Narrator Adso reminisces about his feelings for the peasant girl, knowing they will never meet again in this life, yet feeling her presence in everything around him, just as it was back then. Adso writes, At that moment, the entire world seemed like a book written by God's finger where everything narrated the infinite virtues of the Creator, and every creation was a work and mirror narrating life and death. There even the humblest rose became an annotation on our life's journey. It is evident that the name of the rose refers to the name of the peasant girl, whose name Adso actually does not know, hence the rose is nameless. Simultaneously, because everything reminds him of this girl, it can also be said that the rose has countless names. This is precisely Eco's intention in renaming the novel from its original title The Abbey Murder Case to the Name of the Rose. He says, The rose is a symbol so rich in meaning that it falls almost into meaninglessness. After all that has been discussed, intellectuals are advised not to assume that having acquired some knowledge and being able to articulate profound truths allows them to impose these on others. However, faced with the tumultuous world, we must also have the courage to make choices for ourselves even if, in hindsight, these choices appear to be misinterpretations. 
works are enriched by misinterpretations, and life might be no different. The rose also appears in the final sentence of the entire book. It is a well-known Latin proverb, formerly a rose, by its name, would give off fragrance. Now, the only thing held by people is the name of the rose. I don't intend to elaborate further on this beautiful proverb. Perhaps it is the last irony and the best blessing a witty and eloquent semiotician can offer to the readers. All right, the interpretation of the content of this book is concluded here for you. In summary, The Name of the Rose is a classic that blends popular detective stories with high-end religious philosophy. The character William in the book believes in the power of reason and knowledge, but in the end, he solves the case in a completely accidental way, leading to the destruction of symbols representing faith, the monastery, and the symbol of knowledge, the library. This is eco-satire on intellectuals. To explore the ultimate ideals and dilemmas of intellectuals, we trace the name of the rose back to its conceptual origins, the two short stories by Borges, The Library of Babel, and Death and the Compass. We point out that while intellectuals can never be omniscient and omnipotent like God, as long as they maintain necessary humility, catastrophic mistakes can be avoided. Finally, we discuss the title of the name of the rose, which itself has no fixed interpretation and requires readers to engage in creative misreading. It is precisely because of this misreading that literary works have rich value, and life has its own unique brilliance. Well, that concludes the content for this episode. If you enjoyed my video, please click like, subscribe to my channel, and share it with your friends. Thank you.